Greetings, relations. I'm known as Shunkawa Kansapa, which is Lakota for black horse. I'm a ceremonial leader in the Lakota tradition, as well as the Native American church. Additionally, I'm a practitioner of traditional indigenous medicine. I'm very honored to share a message with you in observance and celebration of Earth Day. I express gratitude to Reverend Christian Powell for this invitation. Earlier, I cleansed my altar instruments and self with the medicine of sage. Traditionally, before we speak of sacred matters, it is important to invoke the ancestors and elders through sacred song and prayer. I invite you to close your eyes, place your feet on the earth or sit upon her, and open your heart to receive this medicine. This song is one that honors the earth. Great mystery, great spirit, ancestors who dwell beyond the stars, who visit us in our dreams, who walk among us. To grandfather sun, to grandmother moon, to the Wakioyate, the thunder nations who bring the sacred waters, to the four winds that dance upon our beloved mother, the earth, and to all of our relations upon this earth. Shunkawa Kansapa humbly expresses gratitude for my life, for this sacred breath, for the opportunity to walk and learn and grow as a human being at this auspicious time. I pray, Creator, for Oyochkinui Chozanai, health and happiness to my relations gathered to receive this message. Prayers and blessings of health and safety to their family, to their friends, to their relations. I humbly send my voice, Creator, for those that have made their journey through this virus, that they may have an uninterrupted and easeful transition back to you. For those that are left behind to remember and honor their loved ones, I pray for your mercy and your compassion on the journey of grief they are embarking upon. I ask for prayers, Creator, for those that are placing their lives on the line, the health care workers, the first responders, those who are ensuring that the supply networks remain open, 
I pray for their safety, their health as well, and their protection. I acknowledge the spirits of this land, of this place, the indigenous inhabitants, and the wisdom and the practices that they have carried, that they have sacrificed to ensure that they could be preserved for future generations. I pray, Creator, to this virus, for its mercy and its compassion, as it teaches us valuable lessons on how to be human, how to walk in balance and proper relationship with this world. I humbly pray that all of our relations and the very earth herself will thrive for seven generations and beyond. We thank you for this way to pray. Ahecha tu alo. Aho mitakuye oyasi. For me, every day is Earth Day. Every day is an opportunity to remember, celebrate, appreciate, and respect our Mother, the Earth. At this time, we have an unprecedented challenge and opportunity for us to heal and to grow and awaken as a species. In all of the creation stories that bless this earth, there is a consensus that human beings are the last to be created, not the first. Therefore, we are not the zenith and pinnacle of creation, but rather, we are the grandchildren. We have the most to learn. Indigenous cultures respect their elders, those that have gone before those that have walked upon this earth and lived upon this earth longer than ourselves. Our first elders are the earth, air, fire, and water. These are living, sentient beings. Our next elders are the viruses and the bacteria. They have dwelled upon this earth for billions of years. Then come the sacred plant medicines, and finally our animal relations. These are our elders with whom we can counsel and look to for guidance and direction. These elders, this virus, is a teacher, is an elder, is a mentor. We are not at war with this virus. Rather, this is our wake-up call. This is not akin to a terrorist attack. Rather, this is a teaching. And the essence of this teaching is to help us remember our original instructions as a species, namely, to be stewards, loving, responsible protectors, of our mother, the earth, and to all of our relations upon her. It is vital for us to remember this in order that we can alter this unsustainable trajectory that we continue to find ourselves on. We are forced to take a step back through this sequestration it's an opportunity to, to go within, to reevaluate our relationships, not only to each other, but to the natural world herself, to all of our relations upon her. This will be vital for our survival. For this time has been prophesized well before Al Gore shared the science and Greta Thunberg sacrificed her schooling education to draw attention to the plight of our world. The dreamers, the seers of indigenous nations saw this time coming. 
and also duly warned all of us, and yet we were unable to heed and receive their caveats. Each and every one of us <clears throat> has an opportunity to heal and to grow and to learn, to allow this to be the vehicle of awakening for our species. It requires <clears throat> each and every one of us to cultivate a deeper intimate relationship with the earth herself, with all of the beings who reside upon her with us. I encourage each and every one of you to spend time <clears throat> outdoors, to drink in the sweet breath of the mother that has not been this clean in over two decades. Place your feet upon the earth, place your hands upon the earth, connect with her through sacred and holy communion. This time of an involuntary quest, if you will, where we are being asked to sacrifice certain conveniences can bring us closer to the sacred. To conclude the time that I have with you, I ask us to meditate. Please sit up nice and tall upon the cushion or upon the chair. In my tradition, your hands or palms down on your knees, your spine is erect, your shoulders are relaxed, your head is up, chin is in, the tongue is touching the roof of the mouth behind the two front teeth, the mouth is slightly open, and in my tradition the eyes are also open, but the lids are soft, partially closed, because it's important for us to see things as they are, to perceive the truth of what is actually transpiring. Breathe deeply into your body, ladies into your womb, gentlemen into your solar plexus and allow your minds to quiet. If a thought manages to penetrate your awareness, simply label it as thinking and return to this sacred pure breath. We will meditate for a few moments and then I will conclude with a song on the sacred flute. Please continue to meditate as I conclude with the song.
It has been a pleasure to share this message on this day. Many blessings to each and every one of you on your journey of our individual and collectively awakening at this time. Wow, I really give thanks for Chief Philip, um, also known as Black Horse. I didn't know that was the translation of his Lakota name, so always nice to learn new things about our interfaith friends. And I uh, really appreciate some of the remarks he made. This, you know, today is an Earth Day. We celebrate today. It's actually April 22nd, and it marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. It feels like a, a really, um, everything that happens during this time just feels so uh, rich and potent, and it feels particularly potent to me that Earth Day should fall during this uh, time that we're dealing with this virus, which we just learned is actually one of our ancestors. It's really fascinating to me to think about that, that an ancestor as a virus or a bacteria, remember he said the ancestors, the first wave were um, the elements themselves, fire, earth, water, air. And then it's the plants themselves, or the, the viruses and the bacterias um, that have been here for thousands and thousands of years. And so that there would be this um, COVID-19, the coronavirus, this virus um, here for us, not necessarily as an enemy, but as an ancestor here to help us through something. It's, w it's one other piece of information that feels like it feeds into this idea that there is a rich opportunity for us for spiritual awakening, and certainly in our relationship to each other and our relationship to the earth. Um, so I really like how he laid out the ancestors. If you think of the plants and the animals also as our ancestors, that really flips how we have often in our culture thought about plant and animal life and certainly viruses and bacteria um, as, le as, as um, less than us, on the lower, uh, if you will, um, in, in our order of what matters most. And so to think about the wisdom that can come from all these different ancestors is really fascinating to me and I hope um, means something to you too. You know, one of the things that, that um, he talked about in his message too was that we are meant to remember our original instructions and that indigenous people really never forgot those original instructions. And, you know, we haven't really heeded them. And then the scientists came and have, you know, told us about what we need to do in order to save our species, essentially. We're not really saving the earth. The earth is, you know, the earth will regenerate herself, um, although we are here to be good stewards. And our original instructions were to do that, to be good stewards. Even in, in our Judeo-Christian tradition, in the Genesis, um, the first chapter of the Bible, there is this giving over to us the dominion of plants and animals. And that has been misinterpreted for millennia as this idea that we are to be in power over relationship with, um, that we are a higher being uh, of greater value, instead of dominion as an understanding of relationship and responsibility. So the, the stewardship is a responsibility to care for all life, to respect all life. And when we remember those original instructions, what is remembering? You know, when we have these different pieces kind of scattered in different places, which sometimes feels like how life, pre-COVID life anyway, was to me. But the remembering is a kind of collecting in. The remembering is a making whole again. And so if we can remember some of that, it's in our ancestral bones, really, the, this knowing of how to care for ourselves, how to care for our planet, how to, how to really make a life that is full and rich and that truly works for all. That, I believe, is really the quest that we're on and um, the opportunity that is before us. He talks about this as an involuntary quest during this time to give up our conveniences. And I'll touch on that in a few moments. Um, but one of the things I was thinking about as um, we were hearing from an indigenous uh, elder uh, is about Charles Fillmore, one of our co-founders' experience. 
So Charles and Myrtle Fillmore are Unity's co-founders, and Charles actually was born on an Indian reservation just outside of St. Cloud, Minnesota. His father was a fur trapper, and he built them a cabin. And um, one day, apparently, he was a, a baby, under two anyway. Nobody remembers exactly how old he was. And he was just there alone with his mother in her arms. And a band of Sioux, all dressed in, in full regalia of ceremony regalia and painted faces, came in and just stormed the house and took Charles. And he was gone all day long. And he was returned in the evening. And he says he can't remember what happened because he was so young, but he always felt like he was a part of some kind of mystical ceremony, which just sort of gives me God bumps. I don't know about you. But to think about our co-founder of Unity had this this deep connection with, with this ex, ex, some kind of probably mystical ceremony in which he was used, and we don't know why. Yet it does seem like this ongoing relationship between the white man and indigenous peoples or Native Americans in, in this case um, is, is really important for us to continue to work with and to look at but also awaken to. So it's often said by some Native Americans that, you know, there was of course a time when it wasn't safe for them to practice their beliefs in the open and there was, you know, there was widespread oppression and even genocide going on. And so it wasn't safe for them to share with the white man. I'm just using that term as, as it was used at that time. And so a lot of the teachings then went underground, essentially, or were kept secret just amongst um, their, themselves. But there was a prophecy that at some point it would be a, the time to share. And so the time to share um, has more than arrived. <laughs> it's been with us for some time now. So we, we are reminded by, of these original instructions. We have that indigenous blood in all of us in the sense that there is that ancestry that goes all the way back, all the way back to the elements of fire and earth and water and air. And so as we reconnect, we remember so Chief Philip just talked about how we had this involuntary quest right now during this time of the coronavirus to give up some of our conveniences. And as we give up some of those conveniences and some of those old ways of life, it, there's an there's a, a opportunity to heal, right? So there's literally healing going on, right? Healing that we're focused on around the virus for those who contract the virus and safety for those of us who don't have it, not to either pass it on or carry it or to... Uh, to receive it ourselves. So there's, of course, that going on, but there's a bigger healing going on, right? There is a, a healing of the heart. There's a healing of our bodies. There's a healing of, of the earth body that is an opportunity for us to grasp at this time. There's much more to gain by um, maintaining some form of this new way of life. Now, I know that we'll get back to getting in our cars and going places and, of course, going out to work and school and, and those parts of life that are, are more normative for us. But there's an opportunity, too, to look at what is really essential for us. What do we want to put back into our lives? This is really key. This is really a crucial time, I think, for us to be reflecting on that and to take some time. And nature, I know from me, nature is one of the places where I get my answers. I don't know about you, but it's just a place to me of a teeming with wisdom, wisdom from the trees and the, and the contact with the earth itself. Um, if that doesn't maybe speak to you as much, just whatever practices that you have or ways that you have of going within, maybe journaling or drawing or dancing, just different ways that you can bring alive um, w what is here for you now, what is available to us. This is a time when we are all focused on this revelation of what is essential, right? This has been the conversation, only essential businesses are open. So what is essential? I know lots of us were saying, well, unity is essential, spiritual teachings are essential. And so we have found a way to keep that essential teaching coming to you through this technology. Thank goodness for that technology. There's also, though, uh, that bigger question of what is essential that I think is important for us to sit with both personally and collectively to see what is it that we want to bring forward into the new world uh, once we begin to emerge. 
we can find a deeper sense of meaning and connection and care for all, I think, right now. I know I'm discovering some of that, and I hope that you are too. And, you know, there are some basic things that we can do, and I'm just going to highlight three ways that we can stay more grounded. You know, the environmentalists are telling us now, stay on the ground. This is one of the things that we can do to really help the earth is not to fly. Well, I know personally, that's a tough one because I love to travel and you probably, some of you do too, or you may have family across the States as I do. And so flying feels like sometimes either really desirable or basically essential. So if you can't cut flying and airplanes completely out of the picture for yourself, could you back up a little bit and say, is it really essential for me to take this flight? And also when you do fly, there are some things that, that um, we're being told that can help really um, be more efficient and reduce some of those carbon emissions for the earth. We can fly during the daytime. We can fly on nonstop direct flights. We can fly on fuller planes. All of those ways will allow it to be more efficient. So these are some of the really practical things, of course. You can also buy gold standard carbon offsets. So if you want to fly and you, and you buy these offsets, um, then you can feel maybe like you've, you've kind of evened things out a little bit more. But also it's that, of course, for us, the spiritual practice as well as these practical things that we want to do. So staying close to the earth, you know, touching the earth, allowing ourselves maybe to dig in the earth and, and garden or to even just rest upon the earth. That can be a complete, if, you've, if you're not used to doing that or you haven't done that in a while, it really can bring forth a lot of information for us, a lot of guidance or certainly a sense of connection. And that memory of the closeness can sometimes for us stir up that childlike curiosity and, and natural love for nature because we are nature. So we come in knowing that, remembering that, very sensual as children. And, and we begin to forget as we get further away from that. But this is a good time to take more walks, to sit in nature, to find ways that you can connect with nature. Myrtle Fillmore, our co-founder, um, spoke of that, how she just, she said um, exactly what she said, it was, I was almost accused of being a nature, nature worshiper when I was a child. She said, nature is surely the glorified face of God. See the beauty about you. And you do indeed see the manifestation of the infinite mind. Later, when she and Charles were courting, she wrote a letter to him and it was really clear in their letters back and forth how their, of course, their spiritual path was really um, coming together. And that was a key part of how they connected. And she wrote about how she had been invited out into the countryside for um, some people were giving different talks and everybody brought picnics. And, and she kind of drifted off away from the speaking and the crowd and just talked about how the mosses felt under her feet and, and the ferns and just how much she was enjoying nature. And she said when she drifted back, yes, the sermons were great that were being given, but there was something even greater that she felt like God was giving her a sermon through nature. And she wrote about this and said, you know, the others, they were seeing rocks and moss. She said, but how can I explain it? She said, it was like I was in a charmed life. And she talks about this oneness experience that she had during that time. And then she sort of stops herself in mid-sentence and says, oh, but what have I said? And then she realizes, no, he gets it. You know, he understands like she does, that there is an experience of oneness with all life that we can have when we are close to the earth. So that's um, another way that we can stay grounded spiritually is by letting ourselves be in connection and prayer and maybe taking our practices outside, our meditation, our, our prayer time, um, the journaling and drawing I mentioned earlier, or maybe dancing upon the earth. So our friend Kit Kennedy, who's a pretty well-known poet in San Francisco, has written a poem for us today called Earth Dancer. And uh, we're going to go over to Kitts and, and hear her read this poem. Earth Dancer. Contrary to what you may think, some dancing is best done under sunlight. And lucky for us, day has lengthened, bringing light long and plentiful. 
when light raps on the window saying, come out, be open to warmth, accept her invitation. The vegetal, that greening time has arisen. Earth dancer awaits. She says, I who was born under the sway of moon and sea have painted spring from emerald to lime green with a tinge of red bud here, there. Now, now, leave the to-do list, the calendar, and especially the shoulds and all regrets. Leave them all and come into my arms. Hear a symphony of birds unceasing and infectiously joyous. Be buoyant, rejoice with me as I, earth dancer, am being rebirthed among us all. All right, big thanks to Kit Kennedy for sharing that beautiful poem, Earth Dancer. So I want to talk about an aspect that I don't often um, drift to this side, but there's sort of a, I don't know, I might even say a darker force here at play. And it's, there are those who don't want us to remember, you know? They have not wanted us to remember our original instructions for a long time. And they're people who are invested in worldly power and worldly wealth. And they're people who have um, forgotten their own original instructions and don't have the, the vision to see out the seven generations that indigenous people often ask us to think about when we make choices, the impact of our choices now that affect out seven generations. Instead, it's very short term that some of these folks who don't want us to know or to remember um, think in, in those terms and fear losing the old way of life. And so there's a, um, an article that Tyler brought to my attention by Julio Vincent Gambato, and he wrote it, um, he's actually, it was part of the local NPR station in Boston, and it's called Prepare for the Ultimate Gaslighting. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, gaslighting, it's kind of a um, more modern term that's about when somebody tries to manipulate somebody else by making them feel as if the thing that they experienced didn't happen. Um, so they feel a little crazy, you know. <laughs> they start to uh, doubt themselves. Did that really happen? Am I really experiencing that? And so basically what Julio's writing about is that this is, um, there's going to be a, a kind of what he calls a one-two punch to knock us unconscious again. And he says it's going to come from a lot of the advertising industry that, you know, will take advantage of the time that we are vulnerable, this time that we, some of us, have gone through a lot of trauma. We've certainly seen a lot of trauma uh, images, even if we haven't been directly involved in that. And that this gaslighting will come forth, um, the, the advertisers will, will come forth with ways to comfort that. Um, and the gaslighting will be essentially ways of telling us that we, oh, you didn't, that, that didn't really happen. You know, those, those clear images over LA and China, oh, that was photoshopped. And, you know, the, the idea that some of the hospitals kind of looked like war zones, oh, that was completely exaggerated. And nurses wearing garbage bags and wearing bandanas, oh, that was fake news. You know, so we're going we're gonna to experience that, according to Julio, and that seems to be be um, in line to me with what we've experienced just up until now, and now all the the focus and the and the thrust to to reopen the country and and all of that. So, and and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and there are truly economic reasons that all of us um, need. So there's there's a lot going on, but the most important thing is this spiritual experience for us, the spiritual understanding, the opportunity to awaken and not go back to sleep. And so if we are aware and awake to what is going to come to us, we can hold fast to what we've done during this time to wake ourselves up and to say, this is something I'm going to carry into my new life. And this is something I'm going to leave behind. This is a way I'm going to show up in my new life. And this is a practice that doesn't serve anymore, doesn't serve me or doesn't serve life. So I think... You know, that's the key. And I just wanted to bring that forward because I, I do think we're going to get barraged with that kind of thing. Um, and it's going to be easy because our hearts 
um, are vulnerable, it's going to be easy to reach for the fast comforts and the easy gratifications and to lose sight of what matters most to us. So during this time, it's a time to possibly cultivate deepening of our relationships with one another, to, you know, to restructure kind of the ways that our families and our communities and our friends communicate with one another, to reprioritize what matters most. It's a key time to ask that question, you know, what is essential? What is essential for me? And not fall prey to the consumerism, the materialism, and the storyline that's going to try to get us to forget again. So, so what is essential for you? What are your core values? What lines up for you? This is a time to really look and ask yourself, what do I want to invest in? Do I even know what my investments are in? <laughs> are they in fossil fuels? Is that something I want to be invested in? Or could I instead reinvest in cleaner energy sources? And, and what do I spend my time and my money on? And do, what do I listen to? What do I um, watch? You know, is it, Am I bringing in a lot of violence into my consciousness? Or am I bringing a sense of upliftment and possibility and awakening and um, inspiration into my life? So it's, you know, it's just all a matter of what we value. And I think it's getting this time to get clear on what is essential to us, what do we value most, and what actions will best align for us. There are simple things we can do in our own homes that will help us with, with the planet, you know, like not using harsh cleaners, you know. I've gone back to vinegar and baking soda, and it works just fine on everything. So it's those simple choices that we can make that will make a real difference in our lives. You know, Charles and Myrtle were vegetarians in, the, in a time when that was not necessarily very popular, in the early 1900s. And they started the Unity Inn, which was a very popular vegetarian restaurant. And now we're being told, you know, that, that by the, those who seem to be in the know, who study this, that we have a much lighter footprint if we have more of a plant-based diet. So maybe we could consider going a little bit more plant-based to have a lighter footprint. These are the practical things that we can do that also feed our, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our spirits. And then, of course, looking from that, that, that essence of, of who we are and what we want. So I, you may know of the 13 indigenous grandmothers, um, Grandmother Florida Mayo is on the cover of Unity magazine this time around. And um, she is um, also an elder in the Americas, the indigenous Americas. And she's the founder of something called The Path. Now, The Path is created in order to help with um, heirloom seeds and, and really old seeds up to, she talks about some of the seeds they work with are up to 800 years old. And they're seeds that have been kept sometimes in, um, in clay containers um, by indigenous people and, and these heirloom seeds can produce very much, um, much more food. But what's also key is to think back to what we talked about earlier, what Chief Philip brought forward was that the seeds are our ancestors. And so this plant life as our ancestors, she talks about how the seeds carry DNA, they carry information. So those, those understandings of our original instructions are in the seeds themselves. And the seeds are prolific in creating herbal medicine and creating pure food for us. So, so I, she talked to some young women. She says that when she meets young women, she tells them that they are carrying the seeds of future generations, literally humans in the future. And she says they're always taken aback by that. But she also says, you know, we're all carrying the seeds of the future. We're all carrying the seeds of the new life. I think it's really the life that in unity so many of us hold so close in our hearts, you know, that we, we wish for so deeply. And, you know, life gets busy and we don't always do all the right things that are the best things for ourselves and for the planet, of course. We're not perfect. But what we really do want to do is to do our very best to bring forth whatever it is that we can bring forth for, for the good of all. 
So what are you seeding is another way to ask this question. What is it that you are planting that you want to plant at this time? Perfect time, literally, to be planting a garden. But also to be thinking about what is it that you are seeding for the next generation and for ourselves for the rest of our lives. And, and if we plant ourselves, if we put our hands in the earth, and if we are conscious about that which we are p- planting, that, which, that seed idea, if you will, that divine idea that we hold in mind and heart, and we, we water and we nurture, that is the beauty that, w- that, has, um, that will come to blossom and to be prolific in, in an abundance of more seeds of the kind of purity of life that we're recreating together. There are so many good people on the earth. There are so many good things happening in our world. We have so much wisdom and innovation, and we have these ancestors that we can tap. And we can tap them in in various ways, but one of the clear ways is to to get grounded, to, to get connected to this beautiful Mother Earth that we have. So on this 50th anniversary, we really are experiencing clearer skies and clearer waters. It is true that we are experiencing that and let's not forget it. Let's not forget that by indeed this experiment of of backing off the use of these carbon emissions that we are experiencing a healthy healthier environment for all life to thrive. And if somebody tells you otherwise, don't believe them. <laughs> Because this is something that we have experienced that we can remember in the cells of our bodies. And instead, let's move forward with our original instructions. Let's remember together the original instructions that we were given to be good stewards of the earth, good stewards of our relationships, good stewards of our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to come back to what am I seeding? What is essential? And that will guide us through these times. Happy 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and let's close out with an affirmation together. Together, I remember my original instructions. I am a good steward of Earth and all life. And so it is. <laughs>